Nationalists of different stripes in Latin America often blame the United States for much of what has gone wrong in their country. And while there has been plenty of American interventions in the continent, it is way too simplistic to define the footprint of the U.S. in Latin America that way. To see why, join me for this brief explainer on U.S.-Latin American relations. The history of inter-American relationships can be divided into four distinct stages. These are the imperial era, the time of the good neighbor policy, and the Cold War and post-Cold War periods. The underlying logic behind these disparate stages is American power and interests. That is, the way in which the U.S. has chosen to employ the power differential it has always enjoyed vis-a-vis -vis Latin America and the kinds of things the United States has wanted from the region, whether territory, resources, or ideological alignment. Another important variable is geographical proximity. Generally speaking, the United States has been far more interested in its immediate neighborhood, treating Central America and the Caribbean differently than the rest of Latin America, even at the height of its interventionist streak. At the time of the birth of the United States, the international regime was shaped by a balancing strategy where the powers of the time would try to keep each other in check. If anyone got too strong, the others would gang up on it to weaken it. It was the European game, and the U.S. very much benefited from it in the early years. In fact, the very existence of the United States was directly tied to this global struggle, as France, Spain, and the Netherlands saw that helping the American rebels gain their independence was one way to weaken the British. The U.S. was just a small theater in this struggle, known as the Seven Years' War which is how the absolutist kings of Europe ended up supporting an insurrection built around the idea of the first modern democracy. A huge part of superpower competition at the time was the annexation of territory, and in the early years the dynamics of the game were tilted in Americans' favor, as France opted to sell Louisiana in 1803 to the U.S. rather than see it fall to the British or Spanish, and as the United States was able to force the Spanish to cede Florida, given the lack of interest by the other European powers in helping Spain maintain the territory. Thus, not surprisingly, as the U.S. gained territory and self-confidence, especially after the War of 1812, it too saw itself as a player in the European game, and acted accordingly, which is how the Monroe Doctrine came to exist. The new diplomatic policy, announced in 1823, held that any intervention in the politics of the Americas by foreign powers was a potentially hostile act against the United States. It was a bluff, of course, since the U.S. did not have the means to enforce its declaration, and everyone understood it as such. But it did have the backing of the British, who wanted other European powers weaker and free trade with the newly independent Latin American regimes. Thus, the first explicit American policy towards Latin America had far more heft than could be warranted by American power alone. As it happens, the doctrine was also well received by many Latin Americans, including Simón Bolívar, who saw it bolstering the region's independence. It would be much, much later that the Monroe Doctrine would be seen as a byword for imperialism in some parts of Latin America. The feeling of goodwill did not last long, however. As the United States gained power and used manifest destiny as a justification for its expansionism across the continent, regard for American international diplomacy diminished. One of the turning points was 1845, with the outset of the U.S.-Mexican War. This conflict had deep roots. Indeed, Spain had been worried about American expansionism and had tried to deter them by ceding Florida and signing the adams onis Treaty in 1819, which formalized the border between the Viceroyalty of New Spain and Louisiana. With independence in 1821, Mexico inherited the border and the worries of American expansionism. The country tried a new tactic to bolster its position, allowing American immigration into Texas. This backfired, however, as the newcomers, upset at the centralization of the Mexican government and its cracking down on slavery, rebelled along with some Tejanos against the Mexican government. They succeeded, and in 1836, Texas declared itself a republic. Mexico refused to recognize it, but what really prompted the continued conflict was that Texas claimed that its territory extended all the way to the origins of the Rio Grande. When the U.S. annexed it in 1845, the disputed border became an issue between Mexico and the United States, and when on April 25, 1846, Mexican forces killed and captured American troops within the contested land, the U.S. decided to declare war. American forces soon invaded Mexico and by September 1847 occupied the capital of the country, 
This paved the way for the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ceded half the Mexican territory to the United States. It would not be the last time the U.S. would send troops to Mexico, nor would it be the last time that the U.S. would annex Latin American territory. For the next 80 years or so, the U.S. would consider incorporating multiple territories, but in the end would only succeed with two. Before 1860, these were largely machinations related to the balance in the Senate between free and slave states. The most important was the proposed annexation of Cuba, which got the furthest during the Franklin Pierce administration, when in 1854, the U.S. Secretary of State met with several European foreign ministers to discuss the possibility of a sale. But these deliberations became public, and the subsequent public outcry in the North killed the possibility. Other opportunities did not have the same level of official recognition. Rather, they were mostly led by filibusters, Americans who raised private armies and tried to create colonies in Latin America in the hopes that they would then be annexed by the United States. The most famous of these was William Walker, a guy born in Tennessee who founded multiple separatist republics in Mexico and Nicaragua. The latter was his most successful attempt. It was briefly recognized by Franklin Pierce's administration and had financial support from Southerners. Unfortunately for him, he soon ran afoul of Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the richest men in the United States, who had interest in controlling a trans isthmian route through Nicaragua. Walker also ended up facing a unified Central American army who succeeded in defeating him and kicked him out of Central America on May 1, 1857. When the American tried to come back yet again, he was captured and executed on September 12, 1860. After the American Civil War and until FDR's presidency, the United States became less interested in outright annexing territory. Rather, the imperative became securing friendly governments that would protect American economic interests, which was often achieved through military means. This strategy came to be known as dollar diplomacy and became the standard under President Taft. Its roots, however, began with the previous administration in what was called the Roosevelt Corollary. This was an addendum to the Monroe Doctrine where Teddy Roosevelt decided the United States would become the guarantor of any debt that the Latin Americans owed the Europeans. What this meant in practice was the U.S. taking over customs houses and then paying off all debts. In effect, a seizure of various ports around the Caribbean, making the region an American lake. Subsequent occupations would occur not just because of debts, however, but whenever the U.S. thought political unrest would threaten its interests. And in the early 20th century, the United States sent Marines to occupy Nicaragua between 1912 and 1933, Veracruz, Mexico in 1914, Haiti between 1915 and 1934, and the Dominican Republic, 1916 to 1924. Although not its main goal, the U.S. would also gain Latin American territory during this period. The first was as a result of the Spanish-American War, which began after the explosion of the USS Maine, the ship that had come to Havana to protect American economic interests. The fighting was a complete success for the Americans, who forced Spain to cede Cuba, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Two of these islands, Guam and Puerto Rico, remain American territories to this day. And while Cuba and the Philippines were put under military occupation and might have been annexed in a different time, by the turn of the 20th century, there was too much opposition among the American public for that to be a viable strategy. The other place that became an American territory during this period was a six-mile wide area through the middle of Panama, meant to build a canal. Originally negotiated with Colombia, Roosevelt became upset and increased Colombian demands. So in 1904, he hatched a plan where American support for a Panamanian separatist movement single-handedly brought about the Republic of Panama and then renegotiated an even more favorable treaty with the Panamanians. Known as the hay buno varilla Treaty, it originally stipulated the canal area would be American land in perpetuity, but the U.S. would eventually change its mind and return the territory to the Panamanians in 1977 under the Carter-Torrijos Treaty. This imperialistic period changed slowly after the late 1920s, and with the arrival of FDR to the presidency, an entire new era began the time of the good neighbor policy. This period was characterized by the principle of non-intervention as well as reciprocal exchanges between the U.S. and Latin America. Thus, FDR ended all occupations, got rid of the Platt Amendment, an article in the Cuba Constitution where the U.S. had given itself the right to intervene unilaterally, 
and even supported Mexico when it nationalized the oil industry and kicked out several American oil companies. Latin America was relatively skeptical at first, but the policy paid off dividends so that by the time World War II hit, Latin America backed the Americans unanimously. Now, it's true that some of them did so only at the end of the war, countries like Paraguay and Argentina, but the ones that were crucial for the war effort, such as those around the Panama Canal, including Colombia, Venezuela, and all of Central America and the Caribbean, were all staunch allies. Brazil and Mexico also sent troops to the conflict. The Brazilians sent a 26,000 strong expeditionary force that saw action in Italy and had around 1,000 casualties, while the Mexicans sent an Air Force squadron that had 96 combat missions or the Pacific and lost three pilots. The end of World War II marked the highest point in U.S.-Latin American relations. The region backed the U.S.-led post-World War II order as every Latin American state became a founding member of the United Nations and every country except for Argentina was also present at the Bretton Woods Conference that created the IMF and World Bank. Unfortunately, the air of good feelings did not last long. The dynamic completely changed with the onset of the Cold War. Suddenly, the priority for the United States became stopping the spread of communism and containing the Soviet Union at all costs. Everything else took a back seat. This became a major problem for anyone that wanted to do something about the persistent inequality in Latin America, which had been chronic since colonial times, as public good initiatives that might change that immediately became suspect. Even worse, anti-democratic forces and individual dictators were greatly benefited as an easy way to gain favor from the United States was to proclaim oneself as a staunch anti-communist and then conveniently tar anyone who opposed you as a communist. In fact, this dynamic polarized the region so much that it took away moderate electoral options. Guatemala is a classic example. For centuries, Guatemala had had a history of a tiny authoritarian elite that controlled the country and gave few options to the lower classes for social mobility. This began to change with the overthrow of Jorge Ubico and subsequent 10 years of mild reform that became known as the Guatemalan Revolution. Unfortunately for the country, it affected the interest of the United Food Company, an American corporation known for its trade in bananas. And when the Guatemalan government tried to pass a land reform act that would nationalize some of the UFC's land, the company convinced the U.S. government that this was a communist takeover. It certainly helped that the Dallas brothers, who were on the company's board, happened to be the Secretary of State and the head of the CIA at the time. And so, in June 1954, the U.S. orchestrated a coup d'etat that installed a military junta led by Carlos Castillo Armas. For nearly four decades after that, the country would be subsumed in a civil war, an authoritarian regime versus leftist guerrillas, where the Guatemalan government engaged in genocide against indigenous people. In this way, between 1950 and 1991, Every single country in Latin America, with the exception of Colombia, Venezuela, and Costa Rica, would experience authoritarian regimes of one type or another. Most of them happened as a direct result of the Cold War, except for Mexico, which had an undemocratic single-party regime that stemmed from the 1910 Mexican Revolution. Not all the dictatorships were backed by the United States. Cuba became communist under Castro, of course. But some, like Chile under Augusto Pinochet, occurred directly because of the American interference. And all U.S.-backed regimes engaged in torture, extrajudicial killings, and other human right violations, which were not a bug, but a feature. It was during this period that some of the worst massacres in Latin American history took place, such as the San Patricio Church Massacre in Argentina in 1976, the El Mozote Massacre in El Salvador in 1982, the Todos Santos Massacre in Bolivia in 1979, among many others. In fact, dictatorships in the Southern Cone even created a U.S.-backed intelligence program known as Operation Condor, designed to locate and execute dissidents even when abroad. One of the most famous was Orlando Letelier, a critic of the Pinochet regime who died when the car he was driving exploded just as he was driving on Sheridan Circle in Washington, D.C. One of the things that was different about U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War, beyond the prioritization of ideology, was that the usual demarcation of interest around Central America and the Caribbean did not hold. Countries that would otherwise not have elicited much American attention, like Chile in 1973, 
became priorities. Not all of it was negative attention. Bolivia, for instance, received support from the U.S. during its revolution in the 1960s, mostly because Americans became convinced that the regime was nationalist and not communist. Nonetheless, the brunt of intervention still occurred in Central America and the Caribbean. The Cold War was a long list of invasions, covert operations, and arms deals to support dictators in the region. From El Salvador's military dictatorship to Somoza in Nicaragua and Trujillo and Balaguer in the Dominican Republic. The Cold War period culminated with the invasion of Panama in December 1989 and marked a transition in priorities, despite the fact the Soviet Union would officially exist for another two years. George H.W. Bush sent the Marines to Panama not to prevent a communist takeover or to topple some communist regime, but rather to remove Manuel Noriega, the de facto dictator of Panama, who up to that point had been a key anti-communist ally in Central America. Noriega became too embarrassing after his role in drug trafficking became public though. Even worse, he insisted on defying the United States, probably in the mistaken belief that the Americans would never turn on an ally like him. But Bush would not tolerate in 89 what might have been tolerated in previous decades, and soon Noriega would find himself in a Florida prison. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States became the only remaining superpower and roughly for the first decade, the so-called Washington Consensus of Democracy and Free Markets dominated the outlook of the continent. Democracies returned everywhere, except for Cuba, and countries that had at one point been quite protectionist radically altered their markets to join free trade pacts. NAFTA for Mexico, CAFTA for Central America and the DR, Mercosur for South America. This shift led to a complete pendulum swing on foreign policy where constant interventionism gave way to neglect. Now, some critics see this as a benign neglect, others as malign, but regardless of how you see it, it's clear that things have changed. Instead of an all-encompassing ideological concern, American interests have focused on three main issues, drug trafficking, immigration, and free trade. Which of these has been more important has ebbed and flowed over time, depending on who's in the White House and the extent to which the U.S. is preoccupied with other problems elsewhere in the world. But as a rough measure of importance, Attention on free trade is more or less constant, followed by punctuated moments of panic related to drug trafficking or immigration. The latter two in particular have been conflated and are treated as security issues in American discourse, first as potential terrorist threats right after 9-11, as ridiculous as that sounds, and later more as a general sense of dread around the openness of the US-Mexico border. Trump elevated this to an art form maintaining constant rhetorical attention on it with his wall and the supposed invasion of migrants. Out of the three, immigration is the only one that has maintained the traditional geographical boundary of interest as migration from South America is hardly, if ever, part of the political discussion. Not so with free trade and drug trafficking. In the 2000s in particular, under G.W. Bush, the United States tried to create a free trade area that would encompass the whole of the Western Hemisphere it came to naught because of Brazilian and Argentine reticence, but since then, the U.S. has signed free trade agreements with Colombia, Peru, and Chile. The war on drugs, on the other hand, can arguably be said to have been the most negative consequences, perhaps as destabilizing as any Cold War intervention. It has not only brought violence and crime from Rio to Tijuana, but also has compelled countries to spend resources attacking poor peasants from the cocaleros in Bolivia to people caught between the guerrilla and the government in Colombia. And for what? Even as drug kingpins are removed or imprisoned, from Pablo Escobar to El Chapo, it has had zero effect on the price or amount of drugs in the United States. There's little hope that will change, and the most worrisome part is that criminal organizations in Latin America are becoming more and more sophisticated and diversifying into other activities. Given the power disparity that has always existed between Latin America and the United States, the region has had few options in how to respond to American foreign policy. These are the Bolivarian option, that is, one where countries unify to limit American aggression. The Hegemon option, one where the other countries follow the lead of one of the larger countries, like Mexico, Brazil, or Argentina. And finally, the bandwagoning option that is, one where countries try to cooperate to limit potential detrimental actions. Historically, most countries have coalesced around the third option, 
The first option has often failed because although connected by culture and history, interests tend to be disparate, and the region often disagrees on particular modes of action. On the other hand, the second option has failed because Mexico is too close and Argentina too far. Brazil is the only one that could potentially act as a check and has often tried to, but distrust from others in South America, especially Argentina, has often limited their potential leadership. The immediate future of U.S.-Latin American relations looks to continue along this similar path. The only potential shift might be as a result of a rising China, whether that will bring about more or less American attention to the region, or even another Cold War, remains to be seen.